My name is Jen Richter. I've been a co-director of Local to Global Justice since 2014, along with Dr. Beth Swader, who's one of the founding members of that. We have a new co-director, which is awesome, uh, Dr. Suhei Vega, uh, who is upstairs still corralling people. So hopefully we'll get more people down here too. Our theme this year is energizing justice. And we chose this theme for two reasons. One, um, it was finally my turn. My, my field is energy justice. And I was like, you guys, let's do energy justice. And everyone was like, Okay. <laughs> okay, let's do energizing justice, and then we can kind of get these other viewpoints in there too. But this talk is more about the energy justice piece, and then we'll move into the energizing justice, hopefully with Nora's talk, and then into the Q&A as well, how to merge the two together. But hopefully you learn a little bit today about the field of energy production and how to make it more just, which is the subject of a lot of our talks and workshops this morning, and then will be the subject of some of our workshops in the afternoon, looking at Doug Land, the Arizona Interfaith Power and Light. So uh, just really briefly, in terms of energizing justice, we're looking at the energy histories, the transitions and futures. How can we make energy systems more equitable? How can we make them more just? And energizing justice asks, how can we sustain our energy as activists and as community organizers? And so I'll be speaking first from Dr. Jen Richter, uh, Dr. Maria Vitruk, who is actually defending her dissertation on Tuesday. <laughs> transportation, food, waste, all of these fascinating systems, without which it's really hard to live your life. Um, energy is currently produced by several forms, coal, natural gas, nuclear, solar, hydropower, wind, and then of course biomass, which is often referred to with wood. But new innovations are also emerging with new kinds of energy that are affecting what kind of futures we may have, and they make us think about our legacies in the past a little bit differently as well. They're also of course responsible for contributing to climate change, environmental degradation, human health concerns, and geopolitical strife. But you can see the intersections here of climate justice, energy justice, and environmental justice. So trying to bring all of these in conversation with one another. Whereas energy systems are usually thought of these technological systems that are out there, we don't really know much about them. So again, this question of how do we learn more about our energy systems so that we can interfere with them in more just ways. So energy is essential for our society to function. It's increasingly diverse, but also creating new inequalities and exacerbating these older inhistorical injustices that I'll talk about in a little bit. We're also trying to link environmental justice to indigenous rights as well as climate activism, knowing that the two are of a piece. The dispossession of land and labor through policies based on violence and erasure of indigenous peoples has led to the rise of our huge energy infrastructures today that we don't really recognize as being predicated on those kinds of injustices. We've naturalized a trade-off. We can keep using our environment to create energy without ever thinking about those environmental limits, except now we have to think about those environmental limits. These are fantasies from that post-World War II era until about 2000. Those values are reflected in our federal, state, and local policies throughout American history. And I'm going to be sort of Americentric today because we are, in fact, uh, the creators of a lot of these injustices and these patterns as well. So I think it's fitting. But of course, these injustices are all over the world and spreading further every day. So the question is, how do we make better energy systems and futures for everyone? How do we create those more just systems? And so there are terms like energy sovereignty, energy democracy, and a very dangerous term called energy independence, right? Sounds really good, but when you think about how interconnected we are, if you pull one person or one co country like the United States out of the energy system, then you start to see a, a scaffolding of a collapse of all these other systems around them. Okay, first thing to note is that there's nothing natural about the world we made. I'm gonna pull a quote from my friend in the School of Historical Philosophical and Religious Studies, Chris Jones, who's an energy historian who wrote that one of, the one of the peculiar features of the modern world is that cheap, abundant, and reliable energy is available in so many places. Although it's easy to take the state of affairs for granted, it's neither natural nor is it inevitable. I just realized when I moved my face, I'm gonna have to move this over a little bit. Sorry, but fix it the other way. Is that better? Okay, good. Um, current global energy practices are possible only because of massive alterations to the built environment. Much of those are invisible to us when you're living in some place like Phoenix. By investing huge sums of capital, material, and labor into pipes, rails, and wires, we've created a world in which geographic space is largely rendered irrelevant to energy consumption. So there's nothing natural, nothing inevitable, nothing is the way it's supposed to be, 
Everything is the way it is because of a certain set of values that have created this much larger system. This pattern is affected by global supply chains, global instability, and new technologies that are emerging as well. So I wanted to switch here to some of the, the principles, and for those of you who are coming from environmental justice, these are probably very familiar to you, but the basic tenets of distributive recognition and procedural justice, or participatory justice is what I'll frame it as here. So distributive justice uh, looks at fairness and equity. It requires reliable information and transparency in the political process, as well as physical access and freedom to participate in the decision-making process or not. One of the major problems with distributive justice, of course, is that we often couch things in terms of capital. How much does it cost to pollute? How much does it cost to take care of that pollution? We don't have a good value for clean air and clean water. We only have the value when it's been despoiled. And if you can't put a monetary price on it, it's really hard to calculate exactly how much damage you've done. And that makes it, it erases that, that damage itself. Secondly, recognition justice looks at representation, access to political rights, and probably, to me, most important, status and historical context. So often we look at a coal-fired power plant and say, that's just a coal-fired power plant without looking at the larger legacies and histories of those particular installations. Thinking specifically of the Navajo generating station, for instance. A large, one of the West's largest coal-fired power plants up in Page or the Navajo Nation. Um, seeing it as its own separate thing instead of seeing it as part and parcel of a much larger system of land dispossession and labor dispossession as well. So how political power is used to limit recognition of marginalized groups and how and why that marginalization occurs is a critical point of recognition justice. But once you've recognized it, once you've recognized the patterns, you've seen what they are, how do you actually intervene with them? And that's where participatory justice comes in. So participatory justice says we need to incorporate local knowledge because we're dependent on these local environments. So we want, at one point we're like, let's build coal-fired power plants all over the United States, no problem. Mm -hmm. But each part of the United States is very different. So building one in the Southwest versus one in the Northeast has very different politics, very different environmental uses that need to be recognized. You also need access to reliable information, which comes into public engagement and consultation, instead of what has traditionally been looked at as decide, announce, defend. Right? The government comes in, they make a decision, they announce it, and then they defend their decision. So very little public input into those installations. It's very much typified most of the 20th century. You need access to reliable information, public engagement, I'm oh, sorry, I said that already. Institutions and institutional representation is also critical to examine power and privilege, and then to think about how these different installations affect people across time and across space. So you build something in one era, 1972, Navajo Generating Station. How is that affecting us then in 2022? How does its closure then affect the Navajo and the Hopi people in this era? Also incorporating diverse viewpoints and historical claims, and then thinking instead of decide, announce, defend, how do you do consultation versus participation, consensus versus debate? So how do you bring all these things into this process? It's very messy, it's very complicated, and that's why it's very hard to do. But these are all the things that an energy justice approach would ask us to consider as we're considering any new energy installation. There we go. So I want to go through these a little bit more, thinking about distributive justice. This is great um, graphic here on energy insecurity. So these are some of the systemic injustices that come through our energy system that, that intersect especially with gender, race, and class. So thinking about energy as an intersectional process rather than a technological process. So then you have an issue of energy burdens and buffers. If you have to make the trade-off between food and heat, food generally wins. But that means people are living in their homes very cold, they're not sleeping well, they have that stress on their bodies, higher mortality rates. So very difficult to deal with that trade-off. Energy access, the conditions that affect a household's access to energy services becomes part of that distribution. Um, coping of behavioral strategies, how do you actually deal with the stress of not being able to access clean, effective energy over time? If your house is poorly weatherized, you have poor insulation, single pane windows, things like that. Climate threats are a huge one. So going from the individual household to the much larger global pattern is really difficult to understand. We know the climate is changing. We know it's going to destabilize all of the ways that we've built our worlds on this planet. How do we acknowledge that, embrace that, and then try and address that in a just and equitable manner? Going into housing conditions is part of that, and then just transitions. How do we create new types of participation in an energy economy, so especially the new ones that are emerging around things like hydrogen or direct air capture, different things like that. For recognition justice, I'm going to use the example of the No DAPL movement. So this was back in 2015 to 2017, still ongoing, although very much has faded a little bit, but it's the Sandy Rock Sioux against the Dakota Access Pipeline, or Energy Transfer Partners. It's a corporation that was trying to build a pipeline. And in terms of recognition justice, you have a continuation of legacies from these anti-Indian federal policies stemming all the way back to ones that are legal, the Indian Wars, the Indian Removal Act that created the reservation system to displace Native Americans, uh, the Indian Appropriations Act, 
that then uh, created the tr uh, decided they no longer wanted to recognize the treaty system with Native Americans. Uh, the Black Hills Act that then began to separate land into different parcels, and then the Flood Control Act. And these are now federal <laughs> programs that are meant to take the, what was formerly Native American indigenous lands and then make them into federal projects that would serve white Americans and colonizers who were coming across the United States. So taking land from the Standing Rock Sioux to create a floodplain, and then also to use that land to then uh, power major cities in different places without any benefit to the Standing Rock Sioux. So that's a misrecognition on the legal level. Then you have all the de facto ways that this happens. Uh, the utilitarian justification of the greater good, right? So this is for the benefit of America. If you're in America, this will make our lives better without ever acknowledging or recognizing the harm that you're causing by taking away local control and autonomy. Um, capacity and authority are constrained, and I'm thinking here of other federal programs like the Indian Mineral Leasing Act, so going on to Native American lands and telling them you can be the ones to adjudicate your mineral leases, but not giving them the capacity or recognizing that they don't have the capacity to do that in a just manner. So a lot of corporations <coughs> will come onto Indian lands and make their own types of uh, leases that were very unfair and unjust. Um, thinking of that from Manifest Destiny, the Doctrine of Discovery, and then Capitalism versus Democracy, pitting those two together as well. The misrecognition of indigenous origin stories, worldviews, bodies, and practice is then built into that. And that's very much an evidence of energy transfer partners when they had uh, the federal government said you can no longer do anything with this land until we've done an environmental impact statement. And instead they went ahead and bulldozed sacred sites so they couldn't be claimed as being sacred sites, which is very illegal at that point too. And then finally, participatory justice. And this is actually my bailiwick. So I got into environmental justice and justice through nuclear waste policy, which is just as fun as it sounds. So, but it's something that is endless and fascinating, and it makes me think a lot about times and geographies. Um, so I think about nuclear waste management in the United States. We still feel like nuclear energy, at the federal level at least, is very supportable. But at the same time, that support erases all of the legacies of nuclear management that has occurred since the 1940s. One of the things I appreciate about nuclear energy is that it has a very clear start date in the 1940s, but the way its legacies will go on for at least thousands of years, the half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. If you're talking about millions of years of trying to constrain these kinds of radioactive isotopes, it boggles the human mind. So you have legacies of the nuclear fuel cycle from uranium mining to waste disposal, but then we have to figure out what waste is. So for the Navajo miners in the 1950s and 60s, they were used, they were considered a disposable population to mine uranium, but they were never told about the risks, even though the risks were known. So white miners were given more protective equipment, Navajo miners were not given that. And the federal government didn't recognize that until the 1990s, so when people were already dying of radiation exposure. Um, you can see here too the, the protesters against it, but also into uh, nuclear testing as part of that as well. So this is the Nevada test site, the way that the plumes of radiation from the test affected different communities across the West as well, has yet to be redressed in any significant way except for two um, different federal policies. And I'll just point out here that another issue is intergenerational justice. So when I think of nuclear waste management, it's really fascinating to think about, we are going to give this to future generations, but we're not giving them any blueprint or any idea of how to manage this in, a, in an equitable way. Um, so the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, thinking of a participatory injustice, was passed in 1982. In 1987, it was amended. And in that amendment, it, it identified by dint of Congress, a congressional vote, that all nuclear waste in the United States produced commercially would, would be placed in Yucca Mountain in the state of Nevada, which the state of Nevada vetoed. They were like, you cannot put all of your waste on us and just dump it on us. But part of that veto process is that the rest of Congress could veto their veto, which Congress then did, because no other state wanted it, and Nevada was very weak in the 1980s. So you have a participatory injustice there. How can we in the United States put all of this on one state that doesn't want it? And then on top of that, you also have Yucca Mountain is a sacred site for three different indigenous, at least three different indigenous communities in that area as well, who never had a say and were never consulted in that. Then you have your intergenerational justice issue. Future generations cannot consent to this. Right? They literally can't imagine. They will stumble upon these sites, they will be informed of these sites, but what kind of messaging can we leave for them? Right? This is a deeply ethical question that makes this very difficult. And I'll just point out too, the, the Department of Energy and all of its wisdom realized we cannot handle this project. We don't know how to mark these sites. So they asked a bunch of academics how to do it, which is always a bad idea. But they came out with things like these kinds of signs, right? which this is my favorite one, I have to say, because it's so, it says so much more about our culture than it can ever tell future cultures. Um, and these were made in 1988. They're not gonna be used because the DOE saw them and was like, there's no way we can share this with the public. Um, but they are part of the federal record. But even things like AD 12,000, we don't use anodominum anymore. 
right? Um, you have to know what the, the little trefoil actually means in the future. Um, and it pretends that like 12,001, it's gonna be okay, right? We can just, if you give it one more year, it'll be fine, right? But all that's saying is that we couldn't figure this out over 10,000 years, and now it's your problem. Good luck. And what they uh, wrote here too, I think is a really interesting, they're like, what kind of message are we trying to tell the future? This place is not a place of honor, no highly esteemed deed is commemorated here, nothing valued is here. This place is a message and part of a system of messages. Pay attention to it. Sending this message was important to us. We considered ourselves to be a powerful culture. This is an elegy for America, right? This is what we're gonna give to the future. And so this is a really deep way of thinking about what are the messages we're trying to send to the future about our energy today? And can we change that message before it's too late? Right? And I think there's still plenty of time to do that. So I'll switch here into energy transition. So that's kind of the way of thinking about different ways to intervene into energy justice, the different frames, uh, distributed recognition and participatory. When you're thinking about energy transitions, and we are always undergoing an energy transition, we are deep in the middle of an energy transition today. The United States has changed remarkably. I'll show you on the next slide. But we focus on social dimensions and values that are underlying the transitions, the economic, political, cultural, and environmental. The clashes of values, when I think about energy production in the 1950s, it was very much predicated on stability, so creating stable energy systems, um, systems that are affordable, systems that are reliable. But now we have all this infrastructure that's infused with those values, and now we have to shift, because our culture now says we want resiliency, we want sustainability, and we want equity. And those systems weren't designed around those values. So now we're incorporating new systems that can reflect those values, and yet at the same time we're stuck with the old systems too, and that sticks you right in the middle of the transition. And then trying to think of the different scales, the localized to the globalized, the household to the nation, the individual to the community. All of these different uh, levels have to be attended to. So thinking about that in energy transitions, we have to understand the, the flows of energy, how and why did an energy transition happen and where it did, what were the social consequences? I'm, I'm thinking of a, a comment that was made by a Navajo student at Princeton when they were, uh, they made a new, a new movie on uh, uranium mining and she said, no knowledge is produced without consequences. I think that's a really powerful statement that we have, to, we have to reckon with the consequences of everything that we're learning and everything that we're putting out to the world. These aren't just technological issues, but path dependency and technological lock-in are considerations. But the historical, political, environmental, economic context are really critical for understanding why we are where we are today. We have to ask what drives the development and adoption of different energy regimes. So if we're gonna go into a hydrogen economy, the much touted hydrogen economy, pink, blue, uh, green hydrogen, how are we going to produce that? How is that going to happen? What scales? And then thinking about this with the quantitative and the qualitative focus too. So we have all these different factors that we take into account, consumer preference, availability, relative cost, technological innovation, geographic determinants, but we have to really root that into our social values again. How do we make those ideas more equitable and more just as well? So just a quick snapshot, this is the one that really I think is so fascinating. This is the United States energy electricity. This is just electricity generation, not consumption. Electricity and energy are sometimes used interchangeably, but energy obviously is also transportation, heating buildings, things like that. This is just electricity that we use in our houses and buildings. But you can see here already the transition that's occurred over the last 50 years, right? So in 1950, we used very little energy in the United States because we weren't industrialized yet. And then we went through post-World War II industrialization and what you'll see here is this huge, massive growth of coal, and then suddenly, right here in 2010, it plummets. But at the same time, you see natural gas coming in and rising. And those two have basically flipped from 45% coal to 20% coal, 20% natural gas to 45% natural gas. And natural gas is a really tricky one for us now because it's such a geopolitical determinant too. The other one that's really interesting, of course, is this smaller green one, the renewables. And that's actually the one that's growing the fastest right now. The major problem with all these new renewables that we're creating is how to get them onto the grid, how to get them to people. And that, it, therein lies the real problem. We're still thinking about the grid, right? This giant, we have five different sections of the United States. Texas does its own thing. Um, as we all know, every winter they do their own thing. Um, but here we're trying to figure out how do you actually integrate all these new forms into a grid that's very old and not meant for any of these new values that we're producing here too. Also point out that nuclear here has been about 20% for uh, the last 30 years or so and then you have a few other things hanging out in there too. But biomass is not something the United States uses very much. So I'll conclude here with this idea of relocalizing energy sovereignty. And this is not to say that we should have a bunch of tiny energy islands all over the United States, everyone doing their own thing completely separate. That creates a lot of vulnerability. 
But if you have a lot of communities that are trying to do their own energy projects that are diverse, that can work with each other, where one is going down, one can pick up that slack, how do we get those different communities, those different systems to communicate with each other? You have a much better chance for relocalizing energy itself. Um, and I think here, grassroots mobilization is a really important part of that too. And I'll point to the Navajo Nation here too, as well as Chispa is amazing. I'll let Jorge talk about Chispa. But I'll just point to the Navajo Nation. Um, in 2017, SRP decided that they were going to shut down Navajo Generating Station, which is the largest coal-fired power plant in the American West, uh, one of the largest and dirtiest plants that we've ever produced. They made that decision based on the idea that it was going to be too expensive to keep running the plant with increased uh, federal regulations about uh, emissions. What they didn't do was tell the Navajo that they were going to close this plant. And the interesting thing about NGS is that it had a Navajo pro uh, hiring preference policy. So 90% of the employees were from the Navajo. They were the best paying jobs with the best benefits on uh, the Navajo Nation. So when they said they were gonna shut that down, that means the loss of all of those jobs. And also 80% of the royalties um, for the Hopi tribe also came from Navajo Generating Station, the Cayenta Mines. So when they summarily said they were gonna close that, the Navajo said, you can't, you simply can't do that to us. And so they went into negotiations uh, to try and figure out how to make that a more just, a more uh, equitable transition. And so what SRP ended up doing was offering to hire every single Navajo employee somewhere else in the SRP system, not necessarily on the Navajo, but somewhere in Arizona. And so that 80% of those offers were taken up. So that's one way of trying to ease that transition, but they should have thought of that beforehand. Um, the other thing that's been happening is that SRP and others, especially here at ASU, we've been trying to help with this too, is to create two different systems that are based on solar energy for the Navajo. So one is microgrids. So very individual distributed generation on people's backyards, putting in the, the solar panels that can then run um, electricity so people can have lights at night. But then also large scale solar, at the Cayenta solar fields and the Red Rock solar fields for export. And SRP is the uh, purchaser for the next five years of all of the electricity that will then come down here to Phoenix. So it's one way of trying to ease the transition on a local level to make lives better locally, but then also to serve the larger populations that are so dependent on these energy systems. Finally here, before I turn to Maria, I just want to highlight, we're talking about this locally in Arizona, but then there's these reverberation, uh, reverberations throughout the world in the geopolitical scale too. And so one thing that's been really interesting over the past year, and this is always, this is always going to be a fascinating event. We, when we held Local to Global last year, um, Russia had just declared war on Ukraine and had just begun its invasion. Like the day that we were, it was the day before we had our appointment festival. So now we're one year later, and it's been really interesting to think about this, in, at least for me, in terms of the energy systems itself that Russia used this war as a means of, ex of extending its control over the world through its energy systems because it has so much natural gas and so much oil. And they thought they could use that especially as a means of, of making the European Union cave into their demands. And instead what they found is a much more resilient community, luckily a not super cold winter, but also a, a group of nations that were very resistant to this idea and had invested enough into the renewable energy systems to try and defray that. The other issue it created, of course, is that the United States is now exporting a lot of liquid, a uh, lot of natural gas, liquefied natural gas overseas as well, which puts more pressure on our system to, to produce that as well. So even as you want to go towards more renewables, more green energy, there's that larger geopolitical system that needs to be thought of as well. Um, and these are the, uh, the gas lines um, from Russia into, going all the way into Europe. Uh, but what's not seen here, of course, is the opposite side. So the, Russia, the lines that Russia is now building to India and China through Siberia. And as you, if you've been following this news, you know that both China and India are refusing to actually recognize uh, Russia's claims. And that has a lot to do with the energy that they think they can get now as, the, as Russia loses its customers in Europe. So I'll leave you with these thoughts. The complexities, the uncertainties, the vagueness, all of those are tools. They're tools to keep the system from being as just as it possibly can be. It makes the system opaque, it's hard to get into, but one thing I would urge, if you're interested in energy justice, is to look very close to home. Try to learn more about what we're doing in Arizona, wherever you're from, and then try and figure out who is trying to engage with those different kinds of projects and practices. One of my favorite things that I do as part of, I'm part of the Frank Talk Speakers Bureau with Arizona Humanities, and I offer these facilitated discussions on water policy and energy policy in Arizona. And so different libraries call me, and they're like, can you come out to my library in Kingman, or in Winslow, or in Ajo, or wherever, Litchfield Park, and facilitate these discussions. And what I'm so heartened by is that people are so interested in knowing more about this, they just don't quite know who to ask, and they don't know if any on the internet is true, which is valid. So a very interesting way of thinking about how do we engage with our different communities and try and give them that sense of more understanding in order to be more accountable to the people around us. So I'll leave you with that and turn it over to Maria now. Okay. 
thank you everyone for having me here and for Beth and Jennifer for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to focus more on energy, energy sector and social invincibility and visions in Ukraine, but I guess more from a social perspective. And first of all, I would like to thank, I think, all Americans for all the support that has been provided since the full-scale invasion uh, last year. Even though the war started back in 2014, but uh, the last year was particularly um, challenging. Um, so that's my city, where I come from, and that's how it looked uh, just a year ago, and that's how it looks now. And I think um, Ukraine has been a lot in the news, and mostly, and I promised Jennifer that I'll keep on the hopeful side, so I'll try to, <laughs> to keep my promise. Um, so, um, you see a lot of destruction, especially destruction of infrastructure and um, power sector, including also including educational institutions and hospitals and schools and uh, private homes. Um, and but there are also a lot of invisible factors. And for example, if you are uh, a family who has children, your regular day right now will look like most of the food that is perishable food be hard to keep in the fridge or store because um, there is no electricity most of the time. If you want to prepare your food, this means that um, you, you have to be really creative when you do it and how you do it. Um, and if you have children who go to school, most, most of the education, if there is still a physical school available, um, is still done, done online. Uh, even though you can still go to school, but very often children have to stay at home because of threats of uh, air attacks. Uh, so if there is no electricity, there is no online access, and also this means that you have no light. Um, but um, to kind of deal with this, um, I think Ukrainians try to change the narrative, and that's been one of the quite, I would say, powerful tool, how, how these things are talked about. And that's being worked on over the past year. So it didn't um, come like, um, like immediately, it was something that has been worked on. And um, I would like to show you um, a bit of context, and it's going to have, the first few minutes, it's going to have, a, it has a few disturbing scenes of destructions, but nothing uh, that bad I shift box. <laughs> October 10, Russia destroyed 30% of Ukraine's energy facilities. Since then, critical infrastructure is being shelled almost daily. The country is plunged into darkness, cold, absence of service or internet, and Ukrainians chose to surrender. This is what the aggressor state was hoping for, but despite their wishes, Ukraine isn't even thinking about giving up. Currently, the average Ukrainian has about six to eight hours of electricity during the day and four hours at night. And that's if they're lucky. But what to do during a blackout? Live. Ukrainians are stocked up on candles, flashlights, power banks, water, thermos flasks, and patients. Every conscious citizen is saving energy as much as they can. People are following an unspoken rule. Only one electrical appliance and one light bulb at the same time. Even when electricity is available, Ukrainians have candlelit evenings. It's romantic and efficient. Doing laundry and cooking food on electric stoves is done later at night when the load on the power grid is lower. But working in Ukraine proves to be a real challenge. Critical facilities, large factories, hospitals, and schools, bought generators and Starlink kits. For those who work remotely, the terrorist state came up with a quest. Find a coffee shop with a working outlet and internet. Usually people follow their same. During an emergency blackout, Ukrainians may end up trapped in their own elevator. In these situations, neighbors take care of each other. Many elevators now have boxes with everything you need while holding on till your release. Points of invincibility were announced in cities with completely destroyed energy infrastructure. These are special places with electricity and internet where people can charge their phones and connect with their loved ones. Despite the threat of shelling, 
energy workers are on the job 24 7. They're doing everything to bring back light to Ukrainian homes as soon as possible. After the constant bombardment, the horrors of the Russian offensive and occupation, problems with electricity no longer seem so catastrophic. Ukrainians are ready to sacrifice their comfort for freedom. Time and time again, saying to the Kremlin, no matter how hard you try to leave us without light, even in complete darkness, we can still see that you are terrorists. What the, the whole context did, it also changed the way um, people who work in energy sector, how they are perceived in society. Because most of the time they're invisible as the type of work they're doing remains behind the scenes, although we, we consume their services daily. But I think it changed how the perspective of how they are viewed right now. Yeah. Like a ray of sunshine under the palm of a child, the light in Ukraine doesn't disappear. It hides. In small and big boxes, in an endless web of connections, and in hiding places with a distinct sound. After all, light chooses places it doesn't want to leave. Then those who feel down in the dark come to the light. Light can be friends with the best ones. It doesn't run away only from them. Only they are allowed to shed the light. And even though the light is still hiding from us, we already know how to find it. And so the dark will surely fade away forever. Groups that get together, 
that people are pulling to different things to support each other. So I think there's this shift in society where um, people just understand that they have to become more like innovators and creators in the moment and, um, without, and provide this mutual support and sharing. So thank you for your attention. I think I'll just finish here. And yeah, thank you for all the support that American society provided to Ukraine over the past year. excited to share uh, some of my work that I did um, during my dissertation and how um, I'm using those lessons to my community work today. Um, so um, uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so who am I? I identify as a mestice or a chaboti, which is basically the Raramuri word to name settlers or non-indigenous people. Um, I grew up in, in the city of Puebla, um, but I've been working with uh, Raramuri communities for almost uh, five years in my life. Um, and so, yeah, I, I approach this as a settler, as a Chabochi, um, working with and for indigenous communities um, in Chihuahua. And for me, um, participation and engagement is really important. Um, I. Um, you know, in my community work, or even, uh, yeah, everywhere where I'm at, um, I try to bring um, the um, customer uh, experiences or the end user um, kind of perceptions to inform what we're doing. Um, but um, at the same time, it's not really clear what we mean when they say, when we say, oh, we want the community to participate. What does that mean? Um, Jane mentioned what is the difference between participation and consultation, or participation and blah blah blah. You know, so it's the, those both words are like uh, a little like oh, what do you really mean? Uh, but I really care about it. So that's where I'm starting, and uh, I believe that we need to be really critical about how we understand it, how we measure it, uh, to understand um, whether what we're proposing or doing is actually doing what we want or we're gonna repeating, or we'll be repeating the same uh, historical oppression um, that we have today. So that's, that's uh, the motivation behind my work. And what I try to do is um, try to look at what's the role of engagement in an en energy transition. So this is uh, the picture of Mexico. I am from a city that is here. Um, so this is Puebla. But the, my site of research and what I've been doing most of my community uh, work um, working with nonprofits in Mexico is in the state of Chihuahua. And this is the area where I've been working. Um, so in this map, you can see the percentage of um, indigenous population in the country. So if you can see, this area is the one with higher um, number of indigenous uh, people living there. And at the same time, in this other map, you see um, the degree of marginalization as measured by the state, by the Mexican state. And as you can see, um, there's almost an overlap between indigenous nations and poverty. Um, so that's where um, the research uh, side um, happened. I collected data from these three municipalities. Most of them are uh, Garamuri uh, nation uh, people. Uh, but there's also Olam, there's also the Peruanes, there's uh, many other tribes that are part of um, this region. Um, and um, there's a, a really low electricity access in this area. The reason why this happens is that um, these uh, communities are far away. Um, it's complicated and really expensive to build the grid that we have and dock them into the, the regular grid. And so um, there have been um, efforts for, from many stakeholders to um, kind of like um, address this issue. 
So um, here I'm listing um, five different uh, types of solar programs that I was able to identify during my research. Um, and I'm just um, going to be focusing more on the federal policy one. So this is um, a program that started um, in 2014 when um, there was an energy reform that created the um, wholesale electricity market in Mexico. Boring stuff, but the idea is that um, they created this, this market to be kind of like in, uh, aligned to um, how the grid works in, in the US and Canada. So we are now working in the same way in which the lowest marginal cost of electricity goes first, and that is solar and wind, and then we have other solar uh, plants or uh, other electricity plants like um, maybe nuclear goes first, and then um, the end we would have gas, because it's easy to turn it on and off, but it's also the most expensive. Anyway, so all of that to say that um, there's a budget in, in the dynamics of, of the market that um, keeps building from um, things that um, the participants do wrong, um, you know, fees that they charge or whatever, and they have this money to build programs that grant electricity to um, communities that don't have electricity right now. So that's how they were, it was created. They built, or they um, had um, top uh, round tables with nonprofits and um, other um, you know, stakeholders to get to know how they were gonna do it. Yet, they didn't include the end users um, in the conversations. So there are many um, issues in the way that this program has been uh, done, and I'll show you later. So that's there. Um, so Metaverde, Suncor, and Mexico are the companies that won the bidings that are now um, offering solar in this area. Um, and you, the other thing that I want to sh uh, make sure that we all know is that the capacity installed is larger than the rest of the solar programs. Um, this is important because the cost um, of these uh, systems is going to be higher than the rest. Um, okay, so in um, based on the rules that they set in those working tables that I was studying, um, they were like, if we don't charge the user, they won't take care of these systems. So we need to charge for the service. That's a, a common narrative that we hear. Um, and um, when I was interviewing um, this, this company, I was like, okay, this is great, I agree with you, but how come, how, how do you decide the amount of money you were gonna, the users were gonna pay? And they were like, oh, that was not our concern. We just wanted a fee, right? And I was like, okay, yes, but if you were advocating for that, you need to account for the, the actual amount of money because you're talking about marginalized communities and they might not have enough money to pay, right? Anyway, so that's, that's the background story there. Um, as you can see, there are many um, solar um, projects across this area. Um, they. Um, come from different um, programs, as I was mentioning. So um, I'm just going to stop there, to, just um, so you know. The rest of the, 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 the next three programs are free, um, and they were a um, good source of data to actually build an argument to kind of like problematize that idea that if you don't charge, people won't use it, um, and then privately owned. So next one. So what I was really interested in was to understand the experiences of users. There's a lot of research in these right many communities about you know, uh, cultural expressions, anthropologists talking about how people behave, do, and blah, blah, blah. But there's not a lot of research about other things like energy and if people are liking or not the technology or like that. And that's why I decided to go uh, um, directly to users. And most of my interviews were with them. And I really didn't care much about policymakers or like that because I wanted to pay attention to the community. Um, and so what I did was um, created a, a scale from one to five to um, kind of like assess if um, users were happy or not with the system. Um, five being not happy at all, to five being I'm really happy with the system. And then the other one, uh, the other indicator that I use is technology acceptance. So I asked for participants if they wanted or not the same program again. And that was my indicator for acceptance. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, we can see now the result um, of these kind of like survey sort of like questions that I did during uh, the interviews. And as you can see, most of the programs have like 
really high level of acceptance, except for the federal policy one. Um, and the same for user satisfaction. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. How come that happened, right? And so I tried to look at what was, what was going on. Next slide. Um, so some of the things that I would like to share about um, this program is that um, high cost were kind of like the main narrative that I heard about why people didn't like this technology. Um, you know, the thing is, um, the capacities installed, installed of the system do not match the electricity needs of the, of the, um, of the users. If you can see here, um, that's the house uh, of one participant. And in the, in the policy, they say that these systems are for a house that has a living room, two bedrooms, a bathroom, a blah, blah, like all of those things. And do you think that that's there in that house? Obviously not. Um, and so, um, and um, the, the electricity that they need um, is it's, um, really low in comparison of the capacity installed of the system. So that's one of the um, issues that I saw there. There's also a, a payment method. They are asking for 200 pesos, which is like uh, $5, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, it might not be a lot for us, but if you're living in poverty, that is gonna be something, you know? And so you, you sometimes, um, you know, um, this is a quote that illustrates this problem. I feel sad because the solar panels are leaving us without money. After we pay for it, um, yeah, they're leaving us without money. Once we pay, we don't have money to buy food, to buy, to buy salt, not even for coffee. We can only afford to pay for the panels. So that shows you like the, 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 what they are facing. Um, some of them also told me that they need to migrate to the city to be able to pay their bills. So imagine, like, it's just like, I was, I mean, um, I was shocked to understand this. Um, and this is, in the first place, a program that is supposed to help them get out of poverty, right? And so it's actually doing the opposite. Um, and then there's also information mismatch in terms of um, most of the programs that are offered to these communities are for free. They ask people to write a signature or to put a fingerprint, and with that, they will get whatever. And so a lot of them, they told me, well, you know, I signed, but then I realized that I had to pay. So um, one of the things also was that most of these uh, solar companies were talking Spanish to them. And these are communities that speak Red Amory as first language. So the information was not really flowing well in, in and like so those are some of the drivers of lower acceptance. So if we go to the next one, not everything is wrong, I would say, with solar. Um, the rest of the programs, people, had, like, they were happy with them because that allows them to you know, do homework, um, be in contact with, with people, um, um, listen to music, have light at night, um, cook, not, not as in the stove, but to turn on the light during night and be able to chop your, your thing to get a meal and like that. Um, so yeah, um, uh, um, in general, what I would like to say is that not all solar have the same opposition from the community as, as the federal program does. However, we need to be really careful about how we design the system in itself to be able to serve our, our customers or the user in the best way possible. Um, yeah, so we can go move on to the next one. And so some recommendations that I have for these um, solar projects are engage with local communities and users. You know, this is 101, um, kind of like almost logic, <laughs> I would say, but it's important. And so we need to include um, the users at early stages of the program to be able to offer a program that is useful for them, understand the electricity needs, so that's one. The other one is cost. I think that, um, you know, coming up with new solutions, um, as uh, Jen was mentioning, maybe like mini grids is a good way to go because you would be using um, a system that is for many houses and the cost might be reduced like that. Um, as part of the um, policy, you cannot share electricity with your system. I was like, what? Like, wh why? Um, so yeah, like offering collective forms of ownership is a, a good one. Um, and yeah, one of the things that I saw in um, why people 
stop using the solar programs. Um, that was one of my questions. And what I realized is it's not because they were free. It's because people were, didn't have enough money to pay for maintenance of the, of the system. Um, so that actually uh, was really illuminating to me, and uh, I'm like now reflecting and said, like thinking maybe like asking people to pay. Um, you know, when they're, they are living in this oppression and, and um, poverty for generations, maybe what we need is to offer them other solutions. Um, and we have evidence that they're actually using the technology because they need it. Um, so those are those some reflections. And the last thing is knowledge is really important. Um, one of the uh, participants, one of my friends, um, he was telling me like, yeah, okay, um, it, it would be nice to decide how big or how small this system would be, but I have no idea how this works. So like, if you tell me, do you need a big one or a small one, I really don't know. Uh, you know. So like, offering information to the users to be able to then decide um, what, uh, what, what to do, it's important. So next one, please. Um, so how does my research influence my community work? Um, one of the things that I found is that sometimes more participation is not the best. <laughs> Let me explain. Um, there's, this is how I think about it now, is that uh, once people participate in many ways, um, you will get some benefits. But then you reach a moment where it's start, it, it starts to be detrimental to your own project. That could be for the amount of money um, you pay, but also the amount of money you require the community to be involved in your activities, you know? If you're having activities all the time, at some point, you know, you might not get a lot of um, interest and like that. Um, so, and to me that was illuminating because I used to say we want more, more participation, more, and now I'm thinking like, let's strategize it. Let's, let's think about um, it as um, um, how to uh, um, manage the, the resources that we have better. Um, have an explicit uh, strategy of engagement. I think that's important. Like build a t with your team. Say, okay, we're going to engage the community in this and that way. Be really explicit about it, um, and also share that with the community and ask their input. Um, then the information is key, as I was um, saying, um, and then learn about indigenous history. Um, in this festival, we'll talk about land, uh, water. I think that is really important. One of the things that um, have been like. Um, really um, good for me is think about the impact of our institution um, in the land. Um, here I have this map. We have the whole gum panels um, from a thesis from someone, uh, Howard, um, which I think is really cool to see. Like, oh wow, what Arizona State? This campus was part of the whole gum panel. Uh, it's really cool. But at the same time, let's think about that. That was stolen land, right? And we have the Salt River community right here. Like, it's just like a few kilometers away. And um, so, you know, just think about the impact of our own institution on that. I think that it's really important. That's how I'm being, like, thinking in my community work. And the last thing, um, I'm also part of CHISPA. Um, I've been, um, you know, being involved there. And I've been uh, facilitating um, one event that is called EJ Escuelita, or Environmental Justice Small School. Um, and what we do is we build a curriculum together with a team um, of CHISPA, um, the context um, and their campaigns to talk about environmental justice issues. And the idea is that we have those community meetings to create the knowledge that we need to inform our fight for environmental justice. And so we've been like doing um, different um, sessions from Black History Month in the like red, red lining policies, for example, to gentrification, uh, to the history of water, for example. And so it's been really great. Like this is last year um, events. Um, we have a uh, event next March 2nd um, about air quality in, in the city. It's gonna be really cool, please join. Uh, but what I'm gonna say is that, or just to conclude, is that, um, I think information is important. Information to make uh, a solar program work fine uh, or have higher acceptance is important, but also in our fight. Um, and so having conversations and creating knowledge is really important, and um, this is an example of how I'm trying to get there. Um, and with that, I conclude.
So, hi everybody. Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna take uh, my talk in a slightly different direction. So Jen was saying at the beginning about how the theme for this conference is not only energy justice, but also energizing justice. And so I'm doing the eyes and part. I'm gonna be talking about um, what I was talking with one of my kids on the drive down here. Um, he was like, what do you mean energy justice or energizing justice? He's like, I mean the like, emotional and spiritual kind of energy. And like, yeah, actually, yes, that's, that's what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, and just briefly about who I am, my name is Nora Timmerman, um, and I am a faculty member at Northern Arizona University. I've been there for 10 years now. And NAU is in what's called Flagstaff, Arizona right now. Um, it sits at the base of the sacred peaks that are sacred to more than 13 different indigenous sanctions, including the Hopi, Dene, Havasupai, Hualapai, Zuni, Apache, Ute, Paiute, and Salt among them. And um, I have been kind of gathering the information that I want to share with you today from a range of different experiences. So one, I teach in programs um, that are about, that are interdisciplinary, that are about community organizing, that are about sustainable communities and environmental justice. Um, and so those students, I'm kind of working with them on a regular basis of like, how do you maintain this work? How do we maintain our energy for it? Um, and I'm an organizer myself um, and a parent also who wants to bring people into the world who have energy to do the work. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna talk about three main ideas today. And I don't have a lot on my slides. I think I'm fairly simple. Um, and I'm gonna be doing a little bit of storytelling. Jen asked me to share some positive stories. So um, for each of these three, I'm gonna try and share a very brief story. Um, okay, so my, my kind of three main themes that I wanna talk about of how to energize justice and how to maintain that energy. The first is about attuning to and thinking about the scale of our work. So the first is, um, Yes, about scale. And then the second, I've called it um, being more than one person. And that's really about our relationships and the relationships we build. The third is um, called acting anyway. And so it's like maintaining, it's like continuing to do the work through failure and mistake and things like that. Okay, so um, let me go in. You've got it, thank you. Okay, so I want to focus on attuning to scale, and I'll just say really quickly that these images are from an exhibit of Frida Kahlo's life that's in Albuquerque right now. So these are artists who made art about her life, and so this is photographs of her. Okay, um, okay, so attuning to scale. I'm going to talk about scale in two different ways: scale uh, temporally, like over time, and then also the scale as in the scope of the work that we're doing. And so there's a few different kind of key points that to me feel like <coughs> they've just been lessons really that I've learned from my own experience and also from learning from other people who are doing this work. Um, the first and foremost that's up here is about learning history. So I've heard people talk about this right um, here in this session today and even in earlier sessions that I was a part of, like how important it is to learn our history. And I really like, and, and it feels to me so true as I work with young people and as I also feel like I'm very much a learner um, and a young person in some spaces that I'm a part of, that um, I don't actually know what's possible until I learn about what people have made possible in the past. And to me, that's extremely energizing, right? Like, um, when I find out that, oh, people have, other faculty members have done work like this, that this is what they've done, I'm like, I could do that too. Um, and at the same time, it helps to um, rein in the scope of what we try and do too. Because I think that our energy can become deflated and we can, if, if we set our sights really high, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that, you know, like we're gonna do that. And then we go and try to do that and we're like, we just don't get anywhere near what we wanna do. Um, that can be really deflating too. And so it can, I feel like there's kind of um, two things going on there about learning from history. It's like 
oh, okay, let me, let me learn about how to rein it in and also let me learn about how to expand and um, move into territory that I didn't realize was there to begin with. Um, and then this other part of scale is really about grounding in ourselves. And so um, I think what I wrote about here and grounding in your community and your self-care, I think um, it can be, it's motivating to do work that impacts us. And so if we are basically working toward our own freedom, what makes us free or what provides us with the care that we actually need, then that is energizing. And so I think that that can be really powerful. So sometimes people will set out to do work that maybe doesn't affect them or their community. And I would just, I find, and I what I talk to my students about is like, find something that does affect you in your community. And I think there's a lot of power and a lot of energy there. And then the second part of that is that your life and what affects you and your freedom and your own care for yourself is not only yours alone. Like that is definitely shared experience. And so the more that we're able to say like, my what, what I need in order to be cared for, in order to be like a free human being existing in community, um, that's, that's not only a need that I have, but that's a need that other people have. And that's something that I feel like we should ground in, find others with those needs and that provides us a lot of energy to move forward as well. Um, and it's certainly not like this piece about pulling in a big vision. It's like, that's work that people have been doing for a really long time. It's part of a larger movement. Um, okay, the story that I wanna tell about this piece is, um, it is related to my own role as a faculty member. And I think it was, I don't remember when exactly, let's say seven years ago. Um, there was a movement on campus at NAU to divest from fossil fuels and there were a lot of students that got involved and they, they, I don't know, they kind of like put, they had some marches on campus and anyway, it culminated in a sit-in and um, a bunch of students sat in at the student union building or kind of the equivalent of that on our campus and um, some of them got arrested and anyway, unfortunately the university did not end up divesting. We're still continuing that work. But as a faculty member, I got an email that said like, hey, do you wanna support these students? You can like bring them food or you can um, send them donations. And I thought to myself, like I wasn't personally super energized by that. What I really <coughs> wanted to do was I wanted to be working with them. I was like, well, I wanna be in the March too. Or like, I wanna be sitting there too. I wanna be, I want to feel like this is a collaborative movement, and but I didn't quite know how to get involved. And I had watched a lecture from Amy Goodman, who's a journalist with Democracy Now. She came to NAU, and she spoke to a lot of us that were gathered there to hear her speak. And she just had this amazing ability to recall history. She was like, oh, I was here at this part of the country and this is what was happening and this is this person in power and we were trying to oust that person. And, you know, and she just was like telling all these stories and she was really grounded in who was doing the hard work to make social change happen. And I was like, I, want, I don't know a lot of the things that you're saying. I need to learn those because I had had my students asking me, you know, they were like, how can we even do anything? And I was like, well, we can, you know, I don't know. I, I had a bunch of things that I said that were probably decently on the point. But um, I realized that if I did my work to learn history, I would be so much more grounded in what is possible to do today. And so that started a new research project for me, which I'm in the process of finishing up, where I looked at like the whole last century and I looked at, well, what, what were faculty members, like myself, again, kind of grounding in my community and my experience, what would they do when um, students would have an uprising on campus? Like how did they actually, were, are there instances where they collaboratively worked with those students and with community members and so I found those, I found all these cases throughout the last century and I dug in the archives to be like, well, what were those relationships like? How did they form them? What were their strategies? Things like that. And so 
just again, kind of grounding in that history to give myself a sense of what is possible. And now I know I can see, I can look at faculty at the University of Michigan who during the draft, they withheld grades. They were like, why don't we submit grades? Because when we do, these students are gonna get drafted. Um, I can look at faculty at San Francisco State University who went on strike for five months with students who were protesting for racial liberation and they put their bodies between the students and the police. And I can say, okay, so I could withhold grades. Okay, so I could put my body between students and police. Okay, now I know more about what's possible and the kind of power that I have in this particular community that I'm a part of. Okay, so that's my story about that piece. And that is super energizing for me. And that's my, part of my story <coughs> of the importance of attuning to scale there. Okay, so this other piece about being more than one person, I mentioned in the beginning, this is really about relationships and relationship building. And when Jen first asked me the question of like, how do you sustain your energy to do work for justice? Like immediately I just thought, well the first most important thing is to just have good relationships with people. Um, and I say the word just, but we know that it's not very simple to have good relationships with people. It's such hard work. Um, but it's crucial, and this phrase, being more than one person, this came from Kathleen D. Moore, who's a philosopher and a climate activist. And when she gets asked, she, she tells a story in a book that she wrote, um, what, that an audience member asked her, um, well, what can just one person do about climate change? And her answer is, stop being one person. Be more than one person. Don't think of yourself as just one person. And so that's, that's the language here, is how do we be more than one person? We have to, if we want to stay energized, and if we want to actually make headway on the issues that we're working toward. Um, so there's so many different components to this uh, about how to maintain good relationships. I think what stood out for me when I was thinking about it was um, I want to want to organize. Like I want it to feel good when I go into a space and I'm there with other people and we're working for some kind of justice work. I, I want to want to go there. Like I want to enjoy those meetings. I want to enjoy those people and enjoy those relationships. And, um, but I also don't only want to work with my, my best friends. Oftentimes we want to extend beyond our circles too. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of trust that needs to get built um, between people that are not necessarily like kindred spirits. And it's possible to do that work, but it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of persistence. Um, and there's this really great, I typed it out, but then I didn't end up putting it on my slide, but there's this really great table um, that Dean Spade made who wrote a book on uh, mutual aid and it's, it's about um, group culture and like helpful qualities of group culture and not helpful qualities. And I'm just gonna say a couple of these qualities really quick because, and I'll, and I'll tell you about how I struggle with them. Okay, so some of the things that are really helpful, for example, are groups that, are, um, that have a realistic workload, a sustainable workflow, a real culture of wellness and care. And potentially harmful qualities are overworking, perfectionist, and martyrdom. And like those are things that I'm not guilty of. All of them. Um, anyway, working on that. Um, but anyway, there's other things like about being having fun together, celebrating each other, eating food together, uh, going bowling together, like just enjoying one another's company and getting to know people. Um, I think that some of the things about knowing each other have to do with knowing each other's strengths. So you can say like, I see that you're really good at this. Could you take this on at our next meeting? Um, or I see that this is something that you've been struggling with. Is there something that we can do to, like how can I support you? Or should somebody else do this work? Or do you wanna work on that? And let's, let's help you work on that. I think, um, that to, to have those kinds of conversations in a way that is productive um, or that, that's like uh, caring requires a lot of trust and that takes a lot of time to build. Um, 
there is a, the story that I want to share for this has to do with um, a group that I wasn't um, hugely a part of as an organizer, but a little bit kind of peripherally a part of um, and helped with um, for, for some years called Wrecking Ball in Flagstaff. And Wrecking Ball is a queer abolitionist dance party that we would put on. Uh, we did that for several years. And um, to go to the Wrecking Ball meetings was always really fun. And it was a lot of, um, it was a lot of people that knew each other really well and could say things like, hey, you're not doing that. Can you like, can you just like do it already or something? <laughs> but nobody would take that personally. It was like we, we had this foundational level of trust um, where that could work. And at the start of the pandemic, Wrecking Ball had to shut down because it was pandemic. And um, we are just now revitalizing it and trying to bring it back and also pass it on to like a new generation of queer folks in Flagstaff. And to me, it feels really interesting to be at the meetings because I can see, I'm like, oh, I can see how it's really hard to teach a new generation of people how to like build relationships and community and the, the level and depth of relationships and community and trust that you need in order to work together kind of seamlessly. Um, and yeah, so I think um, those, those relationships are just crucial and you, I don't know, learn how to build them over time and learn what they feel like over time. Um, and, and they take time to build. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of acting anyway. It's a kind of intense image. But the idea is to, is that, um, like we're gonna make a lot of mistakes and we need to act anyway. We're not gonna know what we're doing and we need to try anyway. And that those things end up being energizing. So um, one of the, one of the things that uh, I, one of the skills that I've learned from that book that I mentioned earlier, Dean Space Nickel Aid, um, is that one of the best things you can do to a new person who has arrived into your space and who wants to work toward justice with you is to give them something to do. Is to say like, hey, would you mind like taking on this task for our next meeting? It could be something as simple as like sending an email or putting something on a community calendar or something like that. But the idea is that um, when, when the tasks and the work are done by fewer and fewer people, then the rest of the folks <laughs> in the group don't feel needed or valued. And so the more that everybody can do the work and that can be shared around, even to folks that are brand new, um, the more we all feel needed, the more we come back and the more energizing that is for your group as a whole. Because as, well, I don't know if everybody else feels this way, but man, when I cross a task off of my list, I love it. <laughs> and so like any time that I can have even just a small little task and cross it off of my list, I'm like, yes, and that gives me motivation to do the next one. Um, and uh, let me see what else I have on the slide. Oh yes, okay, so, I, um, yeah, this, this work of, of, of having the courage to fail, um, is that energizing? Let's see, I just think it's really important. <laughs> so I put it up there, even though I don't know if it's totally energizing. Um, but like, I guess it is, is because if we, I think if we expect from ourselves, and I could say this personally, like if I expect myself to only perform at a certain level or like get it right, then as I was mentioning earlier, like that's really defeating because I'm just not gonna, like it's not gonna be perfect, it's not gonna be right or great. And so if I change my expectations and like really try and orient toward learning or, or just even for me, the language of having the courage, that feels motivating. I'm like, yeah, okay, okay, this is a courageous thing that I'm doing, allowing myself to make this mistake and, and continue on with the work. Um, 
And the, oh, and I wrote up here, everyone's doing this because it's true. We're all, <laughs> we're all in this work still. We're all caring about justice and we're all showing up at the conversation because none of us have been able to like, we, we can't, it's an ongoing work. So we're, we're always making some mistakes and gaining some things and, um, and learning through that in the process, ideally as a community. The, the story I want to share about this, and I'll try and keep this short, is that um, I am, one of the things I'm doing right now is helping to organize an event that's kind of similar to this one. It's a climate justice teach-in um, that's across the Flagstaff community and the Northern Arizona campus. And there are eight of us or so in the group of core organizers. And um, this is the second time we're doing it, and I, um, I have a leadership role in some ways, but I don't want to kind of maintain that and like keep all the power central to me. And so we're rotating, for every time we meet, we're rotating facilitators. So who's gonna facilitate that meeting? We're rotating them. And at our last meeting, we had to make some really important decisions about like what, what are the themes of all the different talks we're gonna have? And let's brainstorm our list of all the different people we're gonna invite. And so somebody facilitated who's brand new facilitating, I think they're 20 years old, and just hadn't had much facilitation experience. And so I met with them a half an hour beforehand or so, just got to know them well, and also like talk through, what are you, you know, how can I support you best in this moment? What are we aiming for? Let's get on the same page. And the meeting went fine, but it did not go great. I took, I had a debrief session with the intern that I'm working on and she was telling me, yeah, I was kind of frustrated because the conversation got off track over here and I don't know if everybody got to say what they wanted to say. I was like, yeah, I think you're right. I don't think they did. And, um, and I chose not to step in in those moments, you know, I ch and, I'm, and I will choose not to just take back facilitating or something like that. But we'll continue to work on that. And, um, because because the the because mistakes are okay and we need to be able to talk about them and we need to be able to work through them and not have that be kind of a defeating moment that brings us all down to you know if, if we were to feel like okay yeah that didn't work that was so bad we have to totally change this that is not an energizing move um, so the idea of like acting anyway moving through all of our challenges. Um, despite the failures and the mistakes that we may make. That's all I have to share. And yeah, thanks to all the presenters who went before me. I love talking about energy justice and I feel excited to have kind of taken in this direction. I'm also excited to come back to your work. <coughs>